hello friends uh, so i'll be talking on this uh, topic utility of uh, bedside ultrasound in icu so it's, as you can imagine this is a very big topic so we do two to three days workshop you could possibly do on this so this topic was uh, given to me for an epicon to address the physicians uh, so this is a very broad based topic uh, but we had to cover this topic in half an hour Uh, so I wish to acknowledge uh, Dr. Amrita who helped me with the content. So the way I would go about is talk about all the aspects where ultrasound is very valuable in ICU and where we use it, and maybe dwell into certain detailing of few of the aspects under a uh, couple of headings because that that's about it we could cover possibly in half an hour. So when you look at uh, all the various modalities where ultrasound can be done as you see there is you can divide broadly into three categories so diagnostic and uh, to guide therapy and interventions and procedures so these are the the ones marked in the red is possibly what i'll try to cover so diagnostic in lung we could look at pleural effusion pneumothorax consolidation interstitial syndrome uh, which is pretty much pandemedema so we have something called blue protocol the various protocols so today i'll touch about blue protocol and uh, in heart obviously it's a separate science in itself echocardiogram we do to assess the lv function rv function cardiac output in icu the echocardiogram we tend to use more to look at the fluid responsiveness adequacy of fluid resuscitation and so on and so forth then uh, the abdomen you have fast and e fast uh, which predominantly er Uh, physicians would be more proficient and they do it more commonly we also tend to do it in cns we do optic now sheet diameter and transcranial doppler so i would possibly touch on this for physicians and interventions you can see the whole list of interventions where ultrasound is used as a norm so pleural tap pigtail insertion vascular axis cvc lines all this to today in this day and age have to be performed under ultrasound guidance and it's a malpractice if any procedure is done without the use of ultrasound aseptic tap peritoneal fluid and arterial lines we could do uh, without ultrasound but sometimes in difficult arterial lines we tend to use uh, ultrasound even tracheostomy we can do it under ultrasound intrathecal injections uh, where we give antibiotics uh, uh, intrathecally we tend to use ultrasounds and now blocks is not our domain predominant anesthesiologists use it especially in trauma patients or pancreatitis where they have severe pain we do put thoracic epidurals and in flail chest we put thoracic epidurals to relieve the pain and optimize their breathing so this is in broad uh, the categories where ultrasound is routinely used in icu but as i said in in this particular recording for the physicians i would cover all this what is marked in red but for this recording i'll only talk about mainly the lung ultrasound and the blue protocol and i would and all others i have covered in other videos you can go back to my youtube channel or website and listen to all of those but today i'll be talking more of lung ultrasound which was which has not been recorded so what is the relevance of lung ultrasound so it is shown lung ultrasound in icu is very valuable in determining various pathologies for pleural effusions the sensitivity of lung ultrasound is 97% and specificity is 94% and lung ultrasound has a good ability to identify consolidation sensitivity is 90% specificity is 98% interstitial syndrome is nothing but where there's a lot of pulmonary edema or it may be cardiac cause or non cardiac cause what we call as ards uh, the sensitivity is 93% specificity is 93% and large pneumothorax you have sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 91% so which means to say the ability of ultrasound to identify any of these common pathologies that happen in the lung seems to be pretty good and in even in occult pneumothorax sensitivity is less but specificity is 100% so this is the sort of stats we have about the utility of lung ultrasound in lung ultrasound or in any ultrasound we use the term echogenicity so there are three types of echogenicity that one needs to bear in mind when we talk uh, with regards to ultrasound in general and in lung ultrasound hyperechoic is where you have uh, hyper as the name sounds it appears as a white structure in ultrasound hypoechoic tends to look as a differential sort of a the um, picture or a differential sort of a color it appears gray 
relative to the surrounding structures and the, the typical hypoechoic structure is cartilage. So this is a trauma patient where you see hypoechoic injury lesion where there is a possibly a blood sitting there or a contusion that has happened. Uh, so you could see something like that. And echoic is very important for ICU. Anywhere there is uh, air or vessel lumens, you would see it as air. So this is, uh, as you see, it looks black. So blood vessels, bone, and empty bladder, all these look black and that is anechoic. So these are the terminologies we use in ultrasound. And uh, these are other pictures, Hyper, hypoechoic you'll see as black, hyperechoic you'll see as white, so it could be calcified areas and anechoic you would see as black. So hypoechoic you can see as a differential color, maybe more of grayish and not as black as anechoic. So that's about the terminologies that we use and uh, all the listeners should be cognizant about the probes that we select for identifying different structures in ultrasound. This every ICO trainee needs to have a clarity as to what sort of probe needs to be used for different uh, ultrasonological examination. So there's something called high frequency probe. Uh, we use common word as linear probe or vascular. So in ICU terminology or parlance, we tend to use vascular probes. It would look flat like this. So these are high frequency. Where frequency is 7.5 to 10. Sometimes you can go up to even 15 megahertz. In this, the resolutions of the images that we capture will be very good in uh, high frequency. But the depth will be less. So it is uh, suitable for superficial structures. And this, as the name sounds, I think it's easier for trainees to remember as vascular probe. As the name sounds, we tend to use this for identifying the vessels when we are cannulating the uh, central venous catheters or dialysis catheters, so on and so forth. And even for lung ultrasound, especially the, the lung point, uh, the upper lung point and lower lung point, we do look for uh, with this uh, uh, vascular probe because we look at the superficial structures, which we'll talk about. So these are high frequency. Then you have a mid frequency. In our ICU parlance, we tend to call it as an echo probe. So the frequency is around 5 megahertz. And the resolution would be moderate. And the depth will be much deeper than the high frequency of the vascular, uh, up to 5 to 6 centimeters or little more than that. So very suitable for cardiac evaluation and echo evaluation. For echo, the typical frequency used is this mid frequency. And then you have a low frequency, which uh, many of the sonologists you would see, we call it as curvilinear probe, where the frequency is 2 to 5 megahertz, and we call it as a curvilinear. Resolutions are poorer because the depth of these probes, it can go much deeper, very suitable for abdominal ultrasound or for PLAPS point, what we say, where we look for pleural effusion and uh, for even therapeutic interventions like ascetic tap, for all that, we use curvilinear probe. So, it has ability to penetrate the much deeper structure so suitable for ultrasound. So this, this picture is something you should possibly remember. Uh, for lung ultrasound, we tend to use vascular probe for looking at the, uh, I'll show you the lung points or the areas which we look at. And we tend to use curvilinear probes and uh, echo probes is predominantly used for our cardiac evaluation. So when we are doing lung ultrasound, one needs to be aware of six zones that we divide into and we look into these six zones. So one is the parasternal line, uh, where the parasternal region, we look at uh, two zones. And then you divide it into anterior axillary line, which is easy. Many of you would know. Then we look at three and fourth zones. And then we go posterior, uh, along the posterior axillary line. So PSL is parasternal, this is anterior axillary line, and posterior axillary line. We look at the PLAPS point, where you have two more zones there. So you have totally six. Here you are seeing four, two zones come uh, beyond this posterior axillary line where we look for the PLAPS point to look for consolidation and pleural effusion. So this is important for all the trainees. So we follow something called blue protocol, which was developed by David Lichtenstein. So this is accepted as a reasonably good way of approaching lung ultrasound. So we divide this chest and we put basically uh, two hands without the thumb uh, just below the clavicle and touching the clavicle. And as you see, the first area which we put the probe and look for the lungs is this the upper uh, sort of a lung area and the lower lung area. So in the middle of this uh, hand, the upper hand is the first point where we put a probe and check for the lung. 
and the second point is the middle of the second hand which is adjacent to the first hand so we place two hands we mark the two points in the middle of these two pawns and these are the two areas we look for and so this is called uh, so this is zone 1 we look we put a vascular probe zone 2 is what i showed you the second one zone 3 is we go on the posterior axillary line so the zone 2 is basically a perpendicular line that we draw from this this area down under which intersects the posterior axillary line we take it as uh, this zone 3 where we do so when you put a probe like this you would see something called bat sign so the bat sign it looks like this so you have a plural line this is the plural line and this is the rib shadows that you would see and this so this bat sign has to be seen and you look for the, something called lung sliding so basically this is the plural line what you see and this is the rib with acoustic shadow and then this is the muzzle what you see and this is the fascia and then you have this neurovascular bundles here so this particular sign is the first one that you see and this is just shown in a schematic way so this is the rib shadow so the, the second one is the plural line so this is the muzzle line this is the fascia and this is the neuromuscular bundle so this is the first sort of a visualization that you do by putting at the first point then you look at something called a lines when you put into the second point you look at the a line so a lines are a horizontal lines which run parallel to this plural line and they are at equidistant to each other and every line we call it as a1 a2 e3 and they are equidistant to each other and presence of a line we call it as a a profile and we call it as a normal lung so if you have this a profile then the indication or the suggestion it gives you is it is a normal lung so the differential diagnosis is patient may have copd or can have pulmonary thromboembolism where the lungs will be normal echoic and uh, so there's no parenchymal pathology that's what it means and for intensive is why this a profile is important is because in icu when patient is sick we tend to give a lot of fluid resuscitation if a profile is seen it really tells you that the lungs are dry and you can proceed with your fluid resuscitation it does not limit you from resuscitating with large volume fluid resuscitation when you see a profile so that's what it means so for intensivists the connotation is if you see a profile then there's a lot of room for filling this patient and giving fluid resuscitation so i'll just show you some videos so this is the lung sliding the next thing that you see is the lung sliding so as you see there is this uh, um, sliding as, as the name sounds so there is the sliding of this plural line along the lung so which you will see which we call so this is the second important thing first thing is you look for a lines the second thing is you have to look for lung sliding and the lung sliding basically when there is a lung sliding it rules out the presence of pneumothorax in someone who is breathless or who is short of breath and it has a 100% negative predictive value which means if lung sliding is there it really rules out pneumothorax if lung sliding is absent then there can be a possibility of pneumothorax so when you do that you put an m mode so once you see the lung sliding sign, you put an M mode, you put a cursor and press an M mode, then you get something like seashore sign. Seashore, as the name sounds, the C is all the muscul musculoskeletal and sand is the lung. Sand is the normal lung. Normal lung looks like a sand and the thoracic wall looks like a C. That's why we call it as a seashore sign. If this seashore sign is there, then there's no pneumothorax and lungs are at least there is no overt pathology of air from air pockets in the lung so it, it rules out pneumothorax so this is again a video which shows there is absent lung sliding as you see there is no sliding of the lung along the pleura so this is a absence so once there is an absent lung sliding if you are a suspicion suppose you are not sure whether it is sliding or not sliding so uh, you can put an m mode once you put an M mode, you get something called stratosphere sign or a barcode sign. So here, as you see, there is no differential of C and a shore. C means where you had this musculoskeletal, which is seen as a, uh, as a uh, C sign, and shore is the lung, normal lung. So there is no differential. This is called barcode sign or stratosphere sign, which indicates that patient has pneumothorax. So when there is absent lung sliding, the differential diagnosis is pneumothorax, or atelectasis, or it can be pleural additions, or someone who is in apneic and not breathing, or phrenic nopalsy. Any of these can show a picture like this barcode sign, but the typical 
situation where you would see a garden variety barcode sign is a large pneumothorax. So this is something very important for intensivists to bear in mind. Then there's something called lung point. So as you see in this video, the lung point is here, there, there is a lung sliding. See here you're seeing the sliding. Here there is no sliding. So which means there is a transition of normal lung to the pneumothorax air pocket. See here it is sliding. So here it is not sliding. So this is a typical lung point. And once you see that you are in doubt, you put an M mode. So here you see there is a seashore sign, musculoskeletal and the sand, which is the normal lung. But here you are seeing stratosphere. So there is an alternating seashore and a stratosphere appearance, uh, which tells you that there is a uh, so, uh, sort of a pneumothorax, uh, which can be uh, identified with this. So a large pneumothorax will show uniformly stratosphere sign. But when there is a lung point, there are pockets. There is a small pneumothorax, which, which is indicated by this with a normal lung. So that is lung point. Then the next one that you would see on the ultrasound is the B lines. So the B lines look like this. So they are hyperechoic lines. As you see, they're all hyperechoic lines, uh, which emanates from the rib shadow and it is it erases all the A lines. As you see, A lines were horizontal lines at an equidistant. And there are no A lines here. A lines are replaced by vertical lines, which extend up to the bottom of the screen. So you have this hyperechoic areas which extend up to the bottom. And the distance between the B lines suggests the severity. If the, it is reference that if there is seven millimeter distance between this, it is suggestive of interstitial edema. The more denser they are, it, in, it indicates alveolar edema. If, it, if the distance between these shadows are less than 3 millimeter, it indicates there is flooding of alveoli with fluid. If it is more 7 millimeter or more, it indicates there is lot of parenchymal edema, interstitial edema. And these are all very important for an intensivist, which indicate the patient is in a fluid overload and this should limit your over-enthusiastic resuscitation and maybe they would need diuresis. And why does this B lines occur? B lines are also called lung rockets or comet tail artifacts. B lines happen due to the thickening of the interlobar septa. I'm sure many physicians or intensivists would know. We call it as curly B lines where there is fluid in the fissures. And that is due to the, there are interlobar septa which separate the different lobes. And there is thickness of these interlobar septa and there is fluid accumulation within this septa. And the ultrasound waves tend to get trapped in this septa and reverberates. And that leads to the B lines. So that is the sonological basis as to why B lines occur. Due to thickness, edema, and the ultrasound waves which get trapped within the septa and reverberates, that leads to the B lines. So just showing some of the videos of the B lines. So this is a video done in our ICU which shows B lines. And as you see, this is a severe pulmonary edema or alveolar edema where you see the distance between the B lines is less than 3 millimeter. So this possibly will indicate uh, alveolar edema and this possibly will indicate interstitial edema. So what are the B line users? One to two B lines can normally be present in 28% of the normal lungs. More than three determines that there is an underlying pathology which may be interstitial edema or alveolar edema. The differential diagnosis of B lines is patients with congestive cardiac failure, or it can be pulmonary edema, or it can be pneumonia, it can be ARDS, or it can be interstitial lung disease. So, so we spoke about A line, which is A profile, normal lung, you can give a lot of fluids. Then you look for B lines, then you look for lung sliding. So first is you look for A profile, then you look for lung sliding, then you look for lung point. And if all this is not there, look if there are B lines. Then when there is no A or B lines, then possibly it could be consolidation or pleural effusion. And there you would see something like this. Then you have to go to the plaps point, uh, which is an intersection of a perpendicular line drawn from the lower uh, point that I showed you and posterior axillary line. And you look, so here you see there is pleural effusion here. And you can see this is an area of consolidation, which we call it as a tissue sign, where you have a hyperechoic sort of a picture with horizontal so horizontal hyperechoic lines on a hypoechoic. So there are two shades and you will see this hyperechoic horizontal lines in this. And this is, this we call it as hepatized lung or tissue sign, which is suggestive of consolidation. So, so that is in essence the blue protocol. So these are the things that constitutes blue protocol. The plaps point 
you look for, you have to put your probe in the posterior axillary line to look for this area of consolidation and pleural effusion. There is a separate video on uh, how you do the PLAPS point to look for pleural effusion and consolidation. You can look, refer that video. So in summary, the blue protocol, first thing you look is lung sliding. So this is what is called blue protocol. This video is mainly to uh, talk about blue protocol. You look for lung sliding. So if lung sliding is present, then you look for whether there is B profile. If there is B profile, then it means there is pulmonary edema. And if it is A profile, then you need to get a venous ultrasound to look for any blood clots or venous thromboembolism. And if there is a venous thromboembolism or a deep venous thrombosis, then you have to investigate whether he has pulmonary embolism, which is the cause for hypoxemia or short of breath. If this is absent, if the vein is normal, then you have to go for the PLAPS. PLAPS is posterior axillary line. You look at the ultrasound and see if there is consolidation. So if there is no consolidation, then the short of breath could be attributed to underlying COPD or asthma. So this is the this is the pathway which, which is called as blue protocol once the lung sliding is present. If the lung sliding is absent, then you, you look at what we call as B predominant profile. So it looks like B profile, then patient could be having consolidation. But if, uh, if it is a A predominant profile, then we have to look for lung point and look for any occult pneumothorax that may be there. If this occult pneumothorax or the lung point also is not there, then one has to look for alternate diagnosis. So this is in essence about blue protocol. Uh, so you may not, if you even don't remember this as a protocol, just remember the first thing that you do is look for A profile, look for lung sliding, then you look for B lines, and then you look for the PLAPS point to look for the consolidation. And that pretty much summarizes your whole ultrasound, lung ultrasound. So all the other things that I would have spoken to the physicians and all the other uh, utility of bedside ultrasound, the, there are individual videos for all of them. So you can go back and refer to for all those other lists that I showed, including all the procedure videos are uploaded on the YouTube. So you can go visit my website to rehear. So in essence, this is about lung ultrasound. So thank you one and all. So end with this beautiful quote. So when we tell people to do their jobs, we get workers. When we trust people to get the job done, we get leaders. So thank you, one and all.